We give you all the praise, glory, and honor for it now in Jesus' name. All that agree, said amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Tell somebody it's good to see you here today. You may be seated. Let's jump into the Word of God. I got a lot to cover and a short time to cover it in, so I want to make sure we get solid on this. We picked up last week, um, we're dealing with evangelism, and as we started talking about it, we really jumped on into the reason why we evangelize is so people won't stand before the judgment. Now, I want to shift gears and tonight talk about the judgment seat of Christ so I can get more honed in on that because we need to deal with that from the perspective that this pertains to us as believers, not from the perspective of that we're trying to get someone saved because every believer is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, period. So this is now talking to us as the church. Now I want to say this, that as I talk about this, understand that my motive is to instruct, to teach, train. I'm not a fire and brimstone preacher. Now, I don't have anything against the fire and brimstone preachers, but if we're all believers, that really shouldn't be the message to us. That's like the message to the unbeliever. And so we're going to take a, uh, this may sound hard as I'm going through it, but just know that we're believers and we're taking a look at what the Word of God is saying about a situation that's coming. We're not looking at this through the fearful eyes of, oh my God, am I doomed to hell? Amen? Got it? Okay. So let's jump in. Let's pick back up quickly and look at the fact that there's two thrones. The first throne is the great white throne of judgment. Revelations chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Just stick that on the screen, and you can turn there if you want. But he says, I saw a great white throne of judgment, and he describes that these are the people that uh, were dead. They did not die in Christ. They died without Christ, and so they found themselves standing before the great white throne of judgment. I don't want to review all that because I had too much to cover tonight, and I want to make sure I get through it. But the great white throne of judgment is not for the believers. We are not to stand before that throne. This is the judgment seat of God the Father. And anyone who stands before this judgment seat is being sent to hell, or let me say to the lake of fire. So this is beyond hell. So we have death, hell, and the lake of fire. Death and hell will be thrown into the lake of fire, and the people who don't believe in Jesus Christ is going to be thrown there with it. Now, when you understand the judgment of God, you see different judgments going throughout human history. And in human history, you see it from the flood, you see it from Sodom and Gomorrah, you see it with the children of Israel being excommunicated from the land they were in, you see it when uh, 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 what's his name? Jonah the prophet is told to go to Nineveh and judge the people so they could repent. But eventually the judgment came to pass on those people. Judgment is a depopulation. That's what it actually is. So write this definition down so you can understand it. So every judgment of humanity is aimed at depopulating the world and obliterating all traces of human history and culture. So in every judgment that you've seen through the Bible, it was a depopulation and an obliteration of the history and culture of humanity. So if you take the flood, there is nothing that we know about any human being before the flood, nothing. We don't have an artifact. We don't know how great the nations have become. We're told they were wicked and evil. But for all we knew, they could have been flying airplanes. They could have had computers. We have no idea. They were 1,656 years in existence from the time of Adam to the time of the flood. When you do the genealogy math, it's 1,656 years. And so what can happen in almost 2,000 years of existence? Well, from the 2,000 years from, from Christ to where we are now, think about what the world is like now. So imagine how developed that world was and God wiped out everything because he didn't want the history or the culture to be ever known because they were so wicked. Well, that's how judgment works. So 
The judgment of God is aimed at depopulating the judgment that we are talking about with the great white throne of judgment is aimed at depopulating not just the earth, but eternity from uh, following the sinful populations of hi and history of this culture. So all these unbelievers, all these people that don't know Jesus, all these wicked people, he is going to depopulate the earth and depopulate eternity through judgment. That's what judgment does. So we ought to be very grateful and thankful that we're saved. Amen. We ought to really be excited about, hey, look, I'm saved. I don't have to face that great white throne of judgment. But write these five populations that will, that will face this great white throne of judgment. I want you to write these down. And let me move to the next point after this. Okay, so number one, the population that doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. So they're going to be before the great white throne of judgment. Number two, the population that doesn't believe in God will be before the great white throne of judgment. Now, notice I said that don't believe in Jesus Christ, and then I said those who don't believe in God. So there are people that they're atheists, they don't believe in God at all, but there are those who don't believe in Jesus, but they believe in God, right? And that's a different group of people because you might have religious people like, say, a Muslim or a Hare Krishner or a Hindu, they believe that there's a God. They don't believe in Jesus Christ. So you follow me? So they're going to be in hell for that. The population number three that believes in God but have enmity towards him. There are some people that know God exists. They believe in him, but they, are, hey, they have hatred toward God. This is where we find in the book of Genesis about uh, Nimrod. It is believed that Nimrod was trying to hunt God and he was using the Tower of Babel as a way to go get God. Some historical writings write about Nimrod saying that he was very upset because of the flood. And so he was trying to hunt God for what God did concerning the flood. Number four is the population that knew Christ and denounced Christ through their free will. Now say this, I'm saved by grace. Say, I'm saved forever. All right? You are saved by grace and you are saved forever, but you could denounce him. And you can denounce him through your free will. Christ is not trying to take his salvation back from you. But you could make a decision, I don't want this no more. And he's going to honor your free will. He's not going to keep you saved if you don't want to be there. If my wife wanted to leave, man, I'd be trying and begging, baby. You don't need to leave. I'd be singing her songs. If you leave me now, I'll be doing what I got to do. But if she leaves, it's on her to, if she leaves. You follow me? That would be on her. You can't make nobody love you. And as man, the gift that we've been given, that is a gift above almost every gift we've been given is free will. That's the likeness of God. When he says the image and likeness, I've been given free will. That's how I'm like God. I can make my own decisions. So you could decide you're going to walk away from Christ, denounce him through free will. All right, there's a fifth population that will stand before this uh, throne of judgment, and that is the population that knew Christ but became defiled. Defiled. All right? So now, that's the judgment, the great white throne of judgment. That's what that is. Now, we got the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to pick up here back where we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. Now, I'm expanding the scripture here so you can see more in the scripture. Notice what it says. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, underline that. We may be accepted of him. Now, why is that in there? I thought I was accepted. But he says we're laboring that we, whether we are present or absent, whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead, would be accepted of him. Underline that and just keep that and we'll come back to it. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that is not the great white throne of judgment. Notice who he's talking to, Corinthians. These are Gentile people, right? And these are born again people. These people have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And he says, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, he's not talking about these unbelievers. He's not talking about people who don't know Christ. He's not talking about people who don't believe in God. He's talking about you and me. We so Paul includes himself in this writing. We all shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Why the judgment seat of Christ instead of the great white throne of judgment? Well, the great white throne of judgment is God judging the whole world for their sin and those who have not accepted Jesus. The throne of Christ, 
the throne of the, uh, 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 the judgment seat of Christ is believers who belong to Jesus. So you and I belong to Jesus. We're in his kingdom. He, we're not per se in the kingdom of God. Now notice I said per se. We are in the kingdom of God because Christ is in the kingdom of God. But, but you go from God to Christ and then everybody who's under Christ. So we belong to him. He's our leader. He's our savior. He's our master. We belong to him. Got it? So if we belong to him, he's the judge. He's going to judge your life. He's the one that's watching you work. He's the one that sees who you talk to every day. He's the one that hangs out with you on the smoke break, whether you think he's not on the smoke break or not. He's the one watching you smoke your weed. He's the one that's sitting there at the beauty salon when you are entertaining all the other things that maybe you should or should not be entertaining. He's the one, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's who we're here to serve. That's who we're here to please. This church building belongs to Jesus Christ. My money belongs to Jesus Christ. My family belongs to Jesus Christ. He's in charge of all of that, so we're going to answer to him for it. You got it? All right, so he says, for we must all, verse 10, appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone, so it doesn't exclude anybody, does it? Not, every, not, not, not any believer. Everyone, we could say every believer, may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether good or bad. So that means I'm going to be judged by Jesus himself for my good that I've done and then also for my bad. Now, I wish I could just erase the bad part, you know, like, let me just white out that. And Jesus, can you just judge me for my good? And he's like, nope, I'm judging you for your good and your bad. Now, this is a very careful deliberation right here, because if you've been taught the wrong way on grace, you won't know that there's a judgment. If you've been taught for the last 20 years in the body of Christ at many non-denominational churches that may not even teach grace, you won't know that there's a judgment. You will think that Christ paid the price for all my sins, so therefore there's no judgment. But he's telling you, no, you're going, to be, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for what you've done, good and bad. Now, right here is not necessarily saying I'm sending you to hell for what you did bad. He's not necessarily saying that. He's saying, I'm judging you for what you did bad. Let me give you an example so I can keep moving, right? Look at this. Yeah, yeah keep going. My, I have three children. I raised three children to adulthood. In the raising of my three children, they've been very good and they've been very bad at different times in the raising of my children. They are children. At least they were children. Now they're adults. When my children were good, they got rewarded, honored, praised. Come on, let's go. You got some good grades. Here's some money. We're going to take you to the store. We're going to buy you all these wonderful things. When my children misbehaved, they got in trouble. And I was not the parent that believed in not sparing the rod. I, and, oh, what does say? I was not the parent that didn't believe in sparing the rod. I was the one that pulled that belt out and, 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 and used the rod. I spanked. So y'all can say what you want to say about that, but that's what I did. So they got in trouble, and I used a combination of trouble, spankings, punishments, whatever it took to get you to act right. Now, I want to point out that they got rewarded for their bad, but they were never not my child. You follow me? I didn't excommunicate them from the family because they did bad. I didn't want to send them to hell because they did bad. These are still my children. So I loved them, and I disciplined them, and I took care of them. This is what we're talking about right here, the judgment seat of Christ. You don't want to go in assuming that because you, were, you sinned here, you sinned there, that your sin is keeping you out of heaven. That's not what he's pointing out at this particular point. What he's pointing out is every Christian, every believer will stand before me at the judgment seat, and I will deal with them based on their good and based on their bad. But this is not saying because you did bad. I'm sending you to hell. What he's saying right here is I'm going to deal with you about your bad. Got it? So your grace is still there. You're still saved by grace. Say, I'm still saved by grace. But verse number 11 gives me something else that I need to look at, and that's the one that got a little tricky right there. Notice what it says. As a matter of fact, let's read the first part together. Ready? Read. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Stop right there. Knowing what? The terror. Terror is deep fear. Meaning what? 
Even though you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says, as Paul, the apostle who saw Jesus in an image face to face in the light when he got born again, says, there's still a terror of my Lord and Savior. Now, we've been taught there's got to be a reverential fear. Let me tell you something. As the days draw nearer and gets more and more wicked, you better understand that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you need to have a certain amount of reverential fear toward him. There needs to be a, an amount that I know I'm saved, but I also know I need to be acting right. Now, once again, I'm not trying to preach fire and brimstone. I know I'm saved, but I know I'm going to stand before that judgment seat. Now, my, my field was law. I've walked into courtrooms at different points and different times and watched the trials take place when people have to give an account for what they did wrong. And it doesn't feel good knowing that this one man holds the, the, the key to whether or not you're going to pay the fine, whether or not you're going to sit a certain amount of time in jail, or whether or not you're going to be free. And there is a fear knowing what this person can do to your life can change it in a minute. Every believer in the body of Christ needs to have a reverential fear of God, but it needs to go beyond this social club reverential fear that we've been having in the church. And that's why you still turn around and Christians don't know the difference between right and wrong. We still need a reverence for Jesus Christ. There needs to be the knowledge that no, he's not trying to send me to hell. But I do want to make sure you do understand what Matthew 28 says. All power in heaven and earth has been given unto me, he says, him, right? And if that is the case, I'm saying, by the grace of God, he's not trying to send me to hell. But let me ask you this question, could he? He is still all-powerful. Would he? He's trying not to. He has you written down, I don't want to. And 99.9%, .9 I will not. We got to deal with that one tenth, one tenth of a percent. That's what we got to deal with. Romans chapter 14, verse number 10 through 12, he says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Read this next part with me. Ready? Read. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right there. We shall all what? Stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So they're still bringing up out of two witnesses, Paul talking to Gentile people who are Christians, and he says, we all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So he says, don't judge your brother because we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. So I'm going to give an account of me to God. I'm not giving an account to you. I'm giving an account to God for myself. Now, I'm 57 years old. The older I get is the more I keep in mind that I'm closer to standing before him, right? The older you get, you know, there are a couple of things that begin to happen. One, some of the things you participated in when you were younger, it's like you realize it wasn't even worth me participating in. Two, you begin to realize over time, I think I might have less years left than I had starting, so you know, but if you believe in 420, I still got more. But if you have less years ahead of you than what you live so far, you realize you're closer than where you need, than where you might want to be at this moment. We all want to go to heaven, but we don't want to die. We're closer to get there. So at that point, you start thinking about the simple fact that did I do things right? Did I get things right? Because I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he's going to judge me. Now, what is he going to judge me for? Say this, everything. I can't hear y'all tonight. Come on, y'all put aside the weight of the day. He's going to judge us for everything, right? Yeah. All right. But what is this judgment for? So let me say this. The judgment seat of Christ is primarily for reward. It's very little for condemning. So the judgment seat was not intended, was not created or intended to condemn us. It was created and intended to reward us if God, if we did not have free will and we could be told what to do and made what to do, God would rather 
have all of us up there getting judged. You did great. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord so all of us could enter there. The only problem that interferes with that is free will. So since we have free will, we know we've missed the mark on some things, and then that's where the questions begin to come in. So what I want to do at this next section is this. I want to clear up your salvation and what salvation has done for you so you can understand standing before the judgment seat of Christ, okay? Standing before means I'm at this point not kneeling before, I'm standing, which means I'm in righteousness. However, he says every knee shall bow, so there will be a point at the judgment seat where you bow, whether it is bowing because of he's rewarding you for your bad you've done, or in the good way, bowing because, Lord, I thank you and I'll bow down to receive from you. But you will bow. He says every knee, sh- and every knee is going to bow out of his lordship. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to show you, I'm going to read through a lot of scripture pretty fast because I still want to get to a certain spot. And I want you to see the assurity of your salvation. I want you to know how saved you really are so you can know it. Amen. I don't want you to question this as you think about standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 through 14, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So he wants to gather us together, right? It goes on, it says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. So that means you already have this inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ so that we would move forward in him, right? And then it says, verse 13, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, there it is, your soteria, your salvation, so now you know you're saved. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So he says, I put earnest money on you. It's called the Holy Spirit. He's called the Holy Spirit. I gave you the Holy Spirit as a down payment on your salvation. So he's saying your salvation is assured. I've assured you of your salvation. So then, Pastor, What about where he says, I'll be judged for my good and for my bad? If he's given me salvation, but I'm going to be judged for my good and my bad, that means one, sin. What about for my sin? Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. So Jesus is the advocate for our sin. I'm trying to get you an assurance of your salvation that even when you sin, he is still the assurance of you, of your salvation. So 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 1 My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. I want to encourage you not to sin. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So he's saying he is the atonement for your sins. So notice he's talking to believers and he says, if any one of us sin as a believer, he is your atonement. Jesus is still your atonement for your sins even as a believer right now. So you know you sin. We know we missed the mark. But he says, I'm still your propitiation. I'm still your atonement. I'm your advocate. I'm your lawyer. I will intercede for you regarding your sin. Look down. At, I mean, go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, and notice what it says. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So when I get born again and I begin to get in the word of God, which is the light of God, it, I, it begins to cleanse me from sin. It begins to work out of me the sin. If you are still in the same sin that you were in, he answers why you're in that sin coming up in the next portion of this scripture. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now I can go to God with my sin and say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me as a believer, and God will forgive me, right, for my sins. Notice what he says in verse 10, and let's read that verse together. Read it with some authority. Ready to read. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, 
and his word is not in us. So what he's saying is the reason you still sin is because you have not been feeding on the word of God. That's why you still sin. The reason you think it's okay to fornicate, the reason you think it's okay to lie, the reason you think it's okay to steal something is because you haven't been in the word of God. So get in the word, walk in the light of the word, and begin to allow that word to push that desire for that sin out of your life. Got it? All right. So Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the advocate for our sins. So right now I've just shown you Christians who sin haven't lost their salvation. Did I not just show you that? All right. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number Two, it says, where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, sin, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, the people of the world, amongst whom we also had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires and flesh of the, uh, and, and of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. In other words, you were a child destined to the wrath of God. He was going to be just as mad as you, as anybody else. However, we are now saved by grace. Look at uh, verse number four, and it says, But God, who was rich in his mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved and have raised us up together and made us seat, uh, sit in, uh, together in heavenly places in Christ. So I was full of sin. I was a sinner, but I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places. However, I went and sinned after I got seated in Christ, but I have an advocate in the Father who is Jesus, who now forgives me for my sin or provides a way for me to repent for my sin. And if I repent for my sin, even though I'm a Christian, he says, you're forgiven for your sin, but I want you to get in the Word and learn how not to sin so you can work on that thing and become a better person. Y'all got what I'm saying tonight? All right. Why did God save me? Why did he guarantee me this salvation? Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Now, he goes on from there, but I need you to see something. He says, I saved you so I could show my grace to you and all my goodness towards you through Christ Jesus. I didn't save you to give you a trial to teach you a lesson. I didn't save you to put you through hardship to, grow, hardship to grow you up. I didn't save you to beat you down so I can make you into what I want you to be. I saved you to be good to you. I saved you to be good to you. The only reason I saved you is so I could be good to you for how long? In the ages to come. That means starting from the day of salvation, God says, I want to be good in your life from this day forward. Stop looking for a trial to teach you a lesson. Stop looking for a trial to make you somebody and rebuke that trial and rebuke that devil and say, Lord, bring your good into my life and walk with that and let God be good to you. Amen? That's the whole reason why he did this. All right. Man. Okay, okay, okay. Are you seeing your salvation now? You know why you're saved. You know you have an advocate, so when you sin, you got somebody to help you out of it all, right? Okay. Skip down to Luke chapter 10. Go over to Luke chapter 10, and I want you to see another scripture. This is Jesus when he tells his disciples I'm giving you power over Satan, right? So Satan can't harm you. So he says, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. That's Luke 10, 19. But when you get to verse 20, he says something else, and I thought this was really good, guaranteeing your salvation again. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I want you to rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So that means you're on the roll in heaven. So where's your name written right now? Heaven. So you might write your name on paper, but he wrote your name on the roll of heaven. So that means you're on the citizenry of heaven. What is it? A ledger? Mm, what do we? Census. You're, you, there's already been a census done. And your name is there. Your name is in it. So if your name is in it, then you can expect that you get the, 
You get the privilege of standing before the judgment seat of Christ to be judged for your good, and you might have some concerns about the bad that you've done, but because you have the ability to repent for the bad you've done, what he's going to say is, which sins did you repent for? Oh, now that changes things a bit, doesn't it? That means I'm standing for the sin I didn't repent for. Ooh. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's, let's now jump into this. So this judgment seat of Christ. Now, are you saved by grace? Who saved you? Jesus. Have you ever sinned? Yes, we all have, right? When you repent, did you get forgiven for your sin? If you're forgiven for your sin, you, you're not going to be judged for the sin outside of the repentance that you get. Now, you don't repent, yet you'll stand before him and he's going to be wondering, what, what, I provided as an advocate your repentance. How come you didn't take advantage of that? So my salvation is secure. Is that right? Why is this scripture in the Bible? Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not, uh, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many, many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. There's judgment. Why is that in there? I just read to you just a small portion of scriptures that talk about the guarantee of your salvation. I only gave you a small portion. I did not give you a lot of scripture. But I'll tell you what, when I sit and I think about this scripture at that moment, it can bring some fear like, okay, hold on, Lord, what, you need to talk to me because something's not lining up right here because I know that I am a human being and I have been doing what I know to do to be righteous, but there are still some areas of my life that I'm growing in and there are things that I have to read the word in to get fixed in me because I know I'm not perfect. I know that I've made some mistakes. I know that I have not nailed, uh, the, the, what is it, uh, dotted the I's and crossed the T's and everything area. I'm still human. Don't look at me like, ah, no, I'm human. I'm human. And I know that one day we will stand before God and the judgment seat of Christ, and I don't want to sit there before the judgment seat of Christ and not get this right. I'm human. So when he says a statement like this, I'm concerned. Now, thank God for grace, but this does concern me as a human. And it should all of us as a human. But say this, I'm saved by grace. You don't understand what he's talking about till you read the verses above this. So let's look at verse number 17 and let's take a look at this verse and notice what he says here. This is what leads into this scripture. He says, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. You follow me? So that's the direction he's going. So you have to base that on what happened before, he said. So corrupt would be the word. Now, corrupt. What does corrupt mean? So let's, let's look at the word corrupt from this standpoint. I don't have a definition for you on this word. I have a different definition for a different word, but I want to just point out. If you have a knife in your drawer and it's your favorite knife and you use that knife to cut your meat, cut your steak, cut your sandwiches, you know, whatever you want to cut, I'm using that knife to cut. That must be a pretty good knife. If you go away on vacation and you come back and you took a nice, good whole vacation, a year off, and you come back to the house and you see that same knife and it's rusty, is it still a knife? Still a knife, but it's rusty. So the rust on that is what? Corruption. Still looks like a knife. It might even still cut in some ways like a knife. It's, it'll be a bit dull, but it might still cut. But rust is corruption. 
Still a knife, but the knife converted into a corrupt knife. If you have a loaf of bread and then you sit the bread out for a while and forget to put it in the refrigerator to keep it preserved a little bit longer, and then eventually you start seeing green on that bread, that's called mold. And that bread begins to mold, and then that mold begins to get contagious on the other slices. Eventually, that bread becomes corrupt. Is it still a loaf of bread? It's a corrupt loaf of bread, but it's still a loaf of bread. What he's pointing out here is there are those people that are like the loaf of bread, that are like the knife. They started out as good quality believers. They loved the Lord. They sought God, but then they corrupted along the road, and that is an act of free will. I venture to tell you that might be one-tenth of a percent of anybody who's in the body of Christ because those of us who really love the Lord, we're not trying to corrupt, but we do need to be aware of the fact that we could corrupt ourselves. You see, what is, what is Satan? Is Satan just a devil? He had to be something before he was the devil. What was he before he was the devil? He was Lucifer. And as described as Lucifer, he was the most beautiful archangel that there was, and according to Ezekiel in the Bible, he was piped with music, he was the worship angel, and he said, the Bible said nothing compared to him, he was the most beautiful creation, he had jewels all through his body, pipes and organs and everything built into him, and crafted by God to worship God and bring the beauty of worship before God, and then he corrupted Acts chapter 5, that story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you remember, Ananias and Sapphira must have been leaders in the church because they were believers and they were mentioned by name. There's a lot of people in the book of Acts that's not mentioned by name. And the Bible says they were taking up an offering for uh, all the people were receiving and were doing an offering for um, for, for a goal that they all had as the church. The apostles were receiving the offerings being laid down at the apostles' feet, and Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit by selling property to give to the Lord, but withheld some of it and kept it for themselves, then died. I always wonder, why was that so significant? Because they had corrupted. See, you think all this stuff is just happening in a day, but it takes time to sell property. It takes time. The church is moving, you know, at a specific time. And so they get to a certain time and they begin to corrupt and they became something that they didn't enter like. They looked like they were regular believers, which is what they were. And then they corrupted. it. You might remember the, remember the story in, in Acts chapter 8, the story of Simon the sorcerer. You know, you see him on the Bugs Bunny cartoon because he was a real, a real person. And so history holds some information on him. But Simon the sorcerer believed in Jesus Christ, got born again, believed in Christ, and got baptized. And then one day corrupted. He literally corrupted. But remember, corruption is an act of free will. Corruption is not something that you and I are going to desire to do, but there are going to be people that are going to corrupt. We call it the apostasy. Remember in the scriptures it said, and there, the, the Antichrist will be revealed after there's a falling away. So the falling away first is the believers who get corrupted. They were believing. They were standing in the body of Christ. Then they decided to corrupt. He doesn't tell you how many that is, but there will be a notable corruption in the body of Christ where all of a sudden people walk away. You say, could that really happen? There are churches right now that have gay conferences, that conferences are designed for families to teach homosexuality in the conference to the children. There are churches that do that. And you, you just may not know about it, but don't think it don't, doesn't exist. I was reading about one just recently that literally held a gay conference to teach gay parents in Christianity how to help the gay children not come out of Christ, how to raise them gay. Corrupt. Corrupt means a person might still be going to church, but has corrupted a person might still be saying, I declare it in Jesus' name, but are corrupted. Corrupt means it looks like the real thing, but you can see the corruption on them because it has become normal for it to be rusty, normal for it to be moldy, normal, and they don't think anything about it. How can you cast out devils in the name of Jesus? How can you prophesy in the name of Jesus? How can you do mighty works in the name of Jesus and be corrupt? But it is possible because Jesus doesn't deny that they did that. He just says, depart from me, I never knew you, which means what? They stood before him 
at the white throne of judgment, at the, at the throne of judgment, and he said, nope, you're not here. Go over to the white throne right there. That's your throne. Yeah, that right there. And they're looking at, whoa, I get to be at the big throne. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, G. Oh. Corrupt. Can I take a five extra minutes? Because I really need to get you to a certain spot. Revelations chapter 3. I need to get you to a certain spot. Verse 1 through 3. This is Jesus. This is not the Father God. This is our Lord and Savior. Passing a judgment. I'm sorry. A preliminary judgment. Judgment before we get to the judgment. On Six of seven churches. The only church that did not get a negative judgment was the church of Philadelphia, which the name Philadelphia means love, so they must have been walking in love. The other six received a judgment, including Ephesians, which was the most mature church in the body of Christ. And notice what he says to the church at Sardis. Revelation 3, verse 1 through 3. And unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Notice what he says. I know thy works. So what is Jesus looking at with all of us? What is he looking at with all of us? Our works. How you serve in church is just as important that you serve in church. Your tardiness is just as important as your own timeness with God. With God. Are you hearing me? Jesus knows your works. You, you will never serve in God's house and he not care. It doesn't matter what church you are in, and, and, and Lighten is no different than any other church. God wants every believer to be serving in church, and he's paying attention to the service. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. So you were alive, and now you're dead. What's going on? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Hold on, hold on, hold on. He's giving them structure. I want you to strengthen what remains. I don't want you to die. There is no, listen to me, there is no church that's planted by God that he wants to die in this earth. So anytime you think, man, that, that church, they need to get rid of that one. Man, it's a mega church. God ain't in it. God is in every single church of his. Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, non-denominational, charismatic, whatever. He's in all his, he loves his churches. There is no great commission scripture that tells you to ever preach against a church. None. There's not one that gives any religion, a Christian belief system, the right to say they're doing it wrong over there. They ain't preaching the truth over there. There's not one scripture that tells you. All it tells you is judge the fruit. Just look at the fruit. It does not give you the right to judge. Our, our preaching against anything should just be preaching against sin in the world so they can get born again. And you're spending all that time cursing out the church over here, getting mad at the church over here, and no time evangelizing who you should be evangelizing. Them people in the wrong church. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. That is not the gate of a church. Gee, if that was the case, then when Jesus fed 15,000 people because it was 5,000 men, that means 5,000, they only counted the men. You forgot to count the women and the children. When he fed 15,000 people, that was a wide gate. Boy, that would mean all of them was going to hell, huh? But Jesus didn't send none of them. Now. He said, I don't want them to faint. Let me feed them. Mm. We need to stop bashing and bad-mouthing other churches. I don't want to do it. I think we need to quit that nonsense. Please, so many lives depend on church. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. I want you to strengthen what remains that's almost dead. For I have not found that works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Read the next two words. Ready? Read. And repent. If I repent, what's going to happen? He's going to forgive me because he's my advocate. So if I repent, everything's going to be okay. But notice what he goes on and says. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come on to thee. Look at verse number four. Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. There's the corruption. He says, you got a few folks that's not corrupt. So what were they in trouble for? 
corruption. The people in the church became corrupt. But he says, but I want to identify there's a few people in here that didn't. There are still some people that are not corrupt yet. Oh, and he focuses on them. And notice what he says about them. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. That's you and I. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about us. Look at verse 5. Talking to those who are corrupt. Now, if it's a few that have not been corrupted, not defiled, there's a bigger group in this church that are. And this is who he's talking to at this spot. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. Remember you found your name was written in that roll in heaven? He said, I'm not going to blot them out, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. They're coming in. I know them, Lord. These are good. These are my people. They're all right with me. Lord, I know them. They're covered by my grace. I know them because they didn't corrupt themselves. You hearing me? Now, to those who didn't corrupt, a small group, he says, y'all didn't corrupt yourself, so you're okay. I'm, I, I know which direction y'all are going in. But to those who did, notice he didn't condemn them right away. He said what? If you overcome, meaning if you bring yourself back from defiling yourself, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to then confess you before my father. You're going to get a white robe also. He's trying his hardest not to send none of his believers to, to hell. He don't want to send nobody to hell. The word defiled, put the definition to defiled on the screen. I want you to see this word, and I'm going to pick up here next week because I want you to understand what this word means. This is the Vines Dictionary, and it means to be smear as with mud or filth, to be foul. It is used in the figurative sense of a conscious defiled by sin. Now, what does that mean? I sinned, so I'm defiled. No, it doesn't mean that. Because we have an advocate and we have a method to be forgiven for our sins. Let me tell you what it means. And this is where we're going to pick up next week on this judgment seat of Christ. It means to come to a place where sin is no longer a conviction to you. You no longer even have a conviction about it. So you got to a place where you know, say for instance, fornication is a sin. Yes, I know it's a sin, or I heard it was a sin, but you know, we're in different days now. It's just a different time. My parents are old school. Ain't nothing wrong with a little something, something every now and then. Ain't nothing wrong with that. What's the matter with that? Ain't nothing wrong with a little. And you begin to convince yourself that that's okay, but, and, but you're doing that until you believe it's okay. Uh, what's the matter with a little white lie? Well, I don't know, but what's the matter with a black lie? What about an Asian lie? What about a Hispanic lie? Ain't no such thing as a colored, non-colored lie. It's all a lie. When you lie, is there forgiveness for your sins? Everybody say yes. When you fornicate, is there forgiveness for your sin? Everybody say yes. But when you become defiled in your sin, Meaning you don't think nothing's wrong with it. A rusty knife don't know whether it's rusty or not, does it? A molded piece of bread would not mold if it thought something was wrong with the mold, would it? When you commit yourself to that lifestyle, commit yourself to everything to the point that you, st that you no longer feel a conviction, no longer the Holy Spirit can speak to you, no longer when you come to church, when the preacher preaching about sin, you, you're not even moved to a con nothing. Hey, 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 uh, and the preacher don't know what he's talking about, man. Look, look, like the, we can wipe that scripture out the, out the man, matter of fact, uh, the, the NIV took those scriptures out the Bible. Ain't none of that. None of that matters. And when you get there, you're defiling yourself. Now, defile is a process because you know it's a process because he says in this scripture, you still got time to repent. So bringing us back to the judgment seat of Christ, 
Who would he be talking about if he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity? I cast out devils in his name. Mighty works in his name. And you go down the list of all you did in his name. And then all of a sudden you become like Ananias and Sapphira. I ain't do that. Ain't no problem with me. What's the matter? No, 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 you should be feeling something. You should be con- sensing in your spirit something that's telling you, now, I think I need to fix that. Next week, I'm going to go through the full definitions of defiled in the Word of God. I'm going to show you different defiles. And when you see those, you're going to realize some of the stuff that is actually defiling is like it's not even something you would think was that big. And you start realizing, I need to make some adjustments. I don't want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and I done served him. You think about from this perspective. I done served him all my life. I was cast. That's what they're upset. I was casting out devils for you. I was doing mighty works for you. Man, I was, I was doing all this stuff for you, and you're sending me to hell. No, 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 no. You did do all those things, but I didn't know you because you, you defiled yourself. You defiled yourself. And you knew it was wrong when you started, but you kept doing it till you convinced yourself it was okay. And you kept going and kept going. Prophecies came across the pulpit and you knew it was you and you kept going. I'm going to close with this testimony. I brought a prophet in. Y'all tell me if you want him to come or not. I'll let the congregation decide on this one. Okay, wait till I finish talking. So this prophet came in at the old building and he's prophesying. He taught a little, then he jumps into his lane. And he starts prophesying. And as he's prophesying, he gets to this, he's accurate on everybody. The people were like, whoa. But he gets to this one person. And I'm sitting in my seat at the old building with Ben, like right here. The other person's like over there. And he says to the person, now you know me, I'm hands off. I'm not in people's business. I ain't trying to be that close to the sheep because I want my stuff to be pure. And he says these words. This is your pastor right here. The guy looks at him. No, listen, this is your pastor. Do not leave your pastor. This is your pastor. You are assigned to this man of God. Now, I didn't know this. I didn't know the prophet. I bought him in at the request of someone, at the, at the uh, recommendation of someone else. And I have no communication with people about my church before they come. So I'm not doing that. I want everything to be authentic in my church. So he says this, much less I didn't know anything about the family and what they were involved in. The family was serving at another church as a member of my church, but serving at another church and then coming over to my church for the service after they served at that church. So they weren't being faithful at my church and they would go work the parking lot over at that church and then come with my church and sit for the service and then go and do other stuff or whatever, but they were playing the straddle the fence thing. Now, I didn't know that. I would have just said, y'all belong over there, go over there, and it could have been done right and everything would have been okay. I don't have any problem with that. I'm not trying to control people. But the prophet told them, this is your pastor. Now, he's telling them in a room with, you know, a hundred people at that time or whatever, and he's telling them, this is your pastor. Do not leave your church. So they heard it. And short time later, the wife was one of my leaders, and she comes and she wants to have a meeting, so she has this meeting with me, and I give her all the details of what I want to do in her area of ministry. And some of this was trade secret. And then she called the next day, church service day, this was a Tuesday, she called on a Wednesday, I'm moving my membership. I said, oh, well, you know, you, I gave you all my trade secrets. Yep, I know, but God spoke and I'm supposed to leave. Okay. You do realize what the prophet said to your husband. I'm leaving. Okay, cool. They left the church. I was thinking nothing about it. I'm like, okay, that hurt, you know, especially having my trade secrets and, and I'm a creative. And so, okay, I got you. Went on, had church. Sometime later, the prophet told him, don't leave the church. So sometime later, they had a baby. The 
baby died. Now, I'm not going to get in the middle of why all that stuff happened. I don't, I don't want to act like God did that or anything, but sometimes you just open a door and you have no covering in your life. That's why having a pastor is important because for me, I've been awake in the middle of the night and told this person is going to die. You need to pray for them. And it's been confirmed even in a church that that's happened. So I've done, you know, like spiritual things like that. So we save people from stuff like that because we're always praying for our sheep at the right way, right time, right moment. So this child dies. Then the husband leaves home and starts living, goes crazy, and is living in a shoebox. Not a shoebox, a, a, a box. So now he's living in a box. The wife had a big career company thing that she had started with someone, and she lost her share in that. She's now going from an independent woman to living with her sister at that time. So life fell completely apart. Now, they had received the prophecy of where it's supposed to be, but they were disobedient. What did he say? He that doeth the will of God, right? He that doeth the will of God. That's the person. we. And so sometimes the will of God doesn't look like what you need to be doing. A couple of years later, and they joined some other church and all that kind of stuff, and the preacher preached over the baby's funeral that God needed another tulip in heaven. And I'm like, that's one of the worst things you could tell somebody who lost a child. God needed a tulip in heaven. That would make pretty much anybody mad at God. The person shows up at one of my church services because of how bad their life had become to repent for what they did, for leaving the way they did, for taking um, my trade secrets and all of that and being disobedient to the fact that God spoke to them and said not to leave. Now, they could have left at any given moment that God released them, so that, that wasn't it. And I'm not the prophet. That was a different prophet who told them this information. They made these decisions. You see, we want to be in the will of God. We want to do what God tells us to do. When we're not obedient to what God tells us to do, we put ourselves in position for forms of judgment to happen in our lives. Now, as believers, I don't believe that God is saying, I'm going to do this to you and I'm going to do that to you. What happens is we begin to corrupt. And as we begin to corrupt, we don't think there's anything wrong with us just making our own decisions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I was talking to my wife and I said, when does a preacher get to a place where he can call his own shots? Because I don't understand how all of a sudden a preacher decides this is mine and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I don't believe we could ever get to that place. I believe we better stay on our face before God and figure out what God wants us to do and get what he tells us to do done so we can stand before him because I don't want to stand before God and he said, I didn't tell you to say that to my people. I didn't tell you to take this much money. I didn't tell you to act like this. I told you to do this and do this job and you should have been doing what I told you. I didn't tell you to mingle with them politicians and those celebrities over there or any of that. I told you to do what I told you to do. Preach, build me a church and serve me. Feed my sheep. And that's my attitude. I'm like, okay, Lord, I, I just want to do what you tell me to do. I don't want to be that person that got outside your will, did what I think was the right thing to do, and ended up losing everything. <sighs> All right. Thank you for giving me a little bit more time. Y'all good?